Welcome back to the second lesson on the idea of the, the baptism of or in the Holy Spirit and I hope you're uh, hanging in there as we go through it. It's always easy to get confused. The Bible says a fool has no delight in understanding but in expressing his own heart. Uh, we need a, an understanding heart, wisdom. Throughout through your precepts I get understanding. I therefore hate every false way. There's a right and a wrong. We need to understand what is right and what is wrong in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit baptism was promised by the prophets. In John 2 verse 28 to 32 is in, After I have poured out my reins again, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will turn blood red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. Anyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. There will be people on Mount Zion in Jerusalem who escape, just as the Lord said. These will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. In Acts 2, 17, 18, we see the, the fulfillment of that prophecy, or the beginning of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Acts 2, Peter, standing up on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus' death and resurrection, said, And it shall be in the last days, says God, I will pour out my, forth my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, yes. And on my servants, my handmaidens, in those days will I pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs on the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapour, smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the day of the Lord come, that great and notable day. The last days. We hear many people talk today about we are living in the last days. But according to the Bible, we've been living in the last days since Acts chapter 2, 2,000 years ago. Jesus was living in the last days. Remember what Jesus said in Hebrews, or, or what uh, the Hebrew writer said. God, who had many and different ways spoken times past by the prophets, does when? In these last days, speak through his Son. When did Jesus speak? 2,000 years ago, he spoke. And that's the last days. We've been living in the last days for the last 2,000 years. The following are important points to understand in the prophecy of Joel. A lot of it is figurative <coughs> and needs to be understood that way. Also is an encapsulation of time. So first of all, the last days, in the events about which Joel 2 speaks would come to pass, was after the Je uh, Jesus' death, burial and resurrection. That's the last days. And quoting this prophecy on the day of Pentecost, Peter interpreted the last days to mean a reference to Acts 2. He says, this is that. The Holy Spirit coming and the salvation of the Gentiles. Acts 10, Acts 70, the last days of the Jewish commonwealth. The end of God's special relationship with the Jews as a nation. This is bad news for a lot of people and they don't want to accept this or understand this. You have many religious groups who are promoting the Jews as still in some sort of special relationship with God today. And that's just not true. They have the same opportunity as everybody else to accept the gospel same way as a Jew and the Gentile in time past, same way as a Jew and Gentile today. We need to believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus and be obedient to the grace of God through the gospel of Christ and come to Christ through the blood of Christ. The promise would be fulfilled after the return of Jews from the dispersion of the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. It would take place during the end of God's special work with the nation of Israel. Not with individuals, but with the nation of Israel. So who administered Holy Spirit baptism? Jesus administered it. John's generic prophecies in Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.8, Luke 3.16, and John 1.33. And then Jesus highlights it in the last week of his life in John's Gospel, uh, 14.26, and 20.19-26, and even just before his ascension as he speaks to his apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 1-8. to And it was fulfilled with the apostles. Acts 2, 1-4, uh, I refer to in Acts 2, 33. 
some people add the House of Cornelius, but there's a reason why we don't include that, and I will see that reason later on. John's generic prophecy, Matthew 3.11. He who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In Mark 1 verse 8, he says, I indeed baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In Luke 3.16, he says, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 1.33, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And 2.33, the Father said, as he, uh, and the Father, as he had promised, gave him, Jesus, the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us. Who was speaking? Peter. Us. Just as you see in here today. So, and Matthew 3, 5 to, to 12, the, then Jerusalem, all Judea, all the region around, when they saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to, to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these very stones. This is where the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees are threatened with the baptism of fire. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. To you as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So all of these passages refer to those being baptized the Holy Spirit and fire. We recognize that every Pharisee and Sadducee is going to be baptized with the fire or the Holy Spirit. And not all who came to John. Not us, not, us, not everybody. These passages specify who the administrator is. It's Jesus who's going to do the baptizing, not one, not who are all the, uh, but it doesn't refer to who all the recipients are, okay? Uh, to clarify that, this is a kind of generic prophecy. He's saying, there's some, some of you guys out here is going to be baptized with fire. He's not, not everybody's going to be destroyed, but some of you will be destroyed. And somebody is going to get uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not all of you are going to get it, but somebody's going to get it. So, when we look at that in more detail, we see they're thrown into the fire, the unquenchable fire. This is talking about judgment. This is not good news. So anybody who's asking to be baptized with fire today, they're asking for the wrong, the wrong thing. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You'll be cast into their fruitless, the chaff, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on. This is not good news. They shall have their part in the lake of fire which burned with fire and crimson, which is a second death. This is referring to hell. Judgment. So, if you want to be baptized with fire today, I would suggest you keep a very low profile. But who? Who is, going to, who is the specific promise meant to for? Uh, the twelve are at last at supper. Jesus washes the twelve's feet. Jesus identifies his betrayer as one of the twelve. And Jesus predicts Peter's denial as one of the twelve. These are all to do with the final destruction. John 14, 26, 15, 26, 16, 13, 15. It's all dealing with the apostles and Jesus' final instructions to apostles before his death. And the Last Supper, it's the apostles who are present. Jesus washes the apostles' feet. Jesus identifies his betrayer and he predicts his denial. These are the final instructions to the twelve before his death. Matthew 26, 20 to 22, when evening had come, he sat down with the, what, 120? Not even the 120, he sat down with the twelve, it says. Mark 14, in the evening he came with the twelve 
but the 120, the 12 he sat down with. When the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them, with firm desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So, most of the information found in John from about the chapter 13 onwards uh, is dealing with the 12. And the promises that Jesus gives about the whole giving of the Holy Spirit is meant for the 12. John 14, 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, who? The 12. All things. And bring to your remembrance, who? The 12. All things that I said to you. If you weren't there, if you hadn't heard Jesus teach, then you couldn't have your uh, things brought to your remembrance. You have to be there to hear something in order to remember it later. And remember and later on when the 120 are gathered together and they're choosing one to replace Judas, one to become one of the 12. There's only two people that they put forward as having fulfilled the ability to be uh, and hear and remember the things that Jesus taught. And out of those two, one is chosen, Matthias, he joins the twelve, because there had to be twelve to begin uh, the new kingdom. <clears throat> John fifteen twenty six says, When the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Here's another qualification. The one who's going to have the Helper bring into remembrance things, were ones who had been with him, with, with Jesus, from the beginning. That's not for everybody. That's not for you and me. That's for the, those who had been with him in the beginning. <clears throat> Luke 24 says, When he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for the Christ has suffered to rise from the dead in the third day, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Notice, Repentance and remission of sins, this is his new message after his death, burial, and resurrection, should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is a new message for a new people in a new time. His new covenant will, his new kingdom, his new family of God is to be established. And he says, at Jerusalem, you, the twelve, the at this it is talking to are witnesses of these things and behold i send the promise of my father upon you but tarry in the city of jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high so the power going to come when the holy spirit comes in jerusalem on the 12th John 15 continues, But when the Helper help comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness. They were to be witnesses, because you have been with me from the beginning. Who? The 120? No. There are only two out of the 120 who could claim to have been with uh, Jesus for enough of his life to be reminded of what he taught. You've been with me from the beginning. The twelve. Nevertheless, John 16 says, Nevertheless, I tell you, oh, sorry, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father, and you because you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Who is he talking to? talking to the apostles. I have still many things, to, but you can't bear them. Let me do that again. But you cannot bear them now. However, this is typical of, of the apostles. You know, time after time after time, Jesus wanted to share something with them. But I'm not saying they were too sick. I, they just mentally weren't ready to take it in. And so Jesus is, is really, he must be frustrated. But anyway, he says, you can't bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of Truth, will come, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. One of the things that the promise of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, was, would be able to do for these apostles would be guide them into all truth. For he won't be speaking with his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit's job wasn't to... Uh, 
magnify the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job was to remind them and glorify the Christ. Remind them of the things that Jesus did, Jesus, Jesus, things that Jesus said, and glorify him. Lift him up, that him being lifted up, we will be drawn unto him. He will take of mine and declare it to you. So he's talking to the apostles. Uh, they would be guided into all truth. And, and the, the thing for many people who claim they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit today, uh, they can't be uh, said to have been guided into all truth because they can't even get the gospel right. When you ask them the message of salvation, they tell you uh, either faith alone or some other 15th century message. Uh, they don't tell you what the Holy Spirit has already revealed in, in Acts chapter 2 and other passages. Uh, and so they can't even get that right, and yet they claim to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' specific apostle, uh, promise was to the apostles. He paired them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you, the apostles, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a specific promise to the apostles. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Until the day which, which is taken up after you through the Holy Spirit had been given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts 1 verse 4 5 he says, And being assembled together with them, who are the them? It's the apostles. He commanded them, who are the them? The apostles, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So here is again he's reiterating or saying again what he'd said to them back in the Apostle John and, and, and John. Also in Luke. Uh, repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name to all nations when beginning at Jerusalem and what would it be? They were to be witnesses of these things and who was to get the Holy Spirit? I send the prom Holy Spirit uh, promise my Father upon you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high so the Holy Spirit was going to come and he was going to come with power they were to wait in Jerusalem for the power to come and the them are the you who are the apostles who this promise was given to. So they, the apostles, met together and they, the apostles, were still confused. They were still thinking of a physical kingdom. And he said, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said to them, the apostles, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority. Wait, you will restore receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There is a commission and they will be empowered to fulfill that commission when the Holy Spirit comes upon them in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. In Acts 1 verse 15 the prayer meeting went on for several days. During this time on the day when about 120 were present, Peter stood up and addressed them. That's the 120. So now we must choose someone else to take Judas' place and join us as witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Let us, that's the twelve, select someone who has been with us, and constantly from our first association with the Lord from the time we were baptized by John until the time he was taken from us into heaven, the assembly nominated two men, Joseph, Justice, uh, also called Barsabbas, and Matthias. When all they, the apostles, all prayed for the right man to be chosen, O Lord, they said, you know every heart, show us which of these men. So the apostles are separate from the 120, and they're saying, show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to face Judas, the traitor, who has gone on to his proper place. Then they drew straws in this manner that Matthias was chosen. Matthias was chosen to be what? He was chosen to become an apostle with the under 11. One of the interesting things about this, the Holy Spirit is never... Um, loose with words. And yet we see in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, 
from 21, uh, maybe a little bit earlier all the way through, maybe seven, eight verses. There's time spent to tell us about the selecting of one man, Matthias, to join the twelve. And Matthias is never mentioned again in the whole of the rest of the New Testament. Why does the Holy Spirit take so many verses to show the selecting of the one man? It's because the one man is to make up the twelve to prepare them to be ready for the Holy Spirit coming. And so when they were ready for the Holy Spirit coming in Acts chapter 2, the twelve were there already to take on the responsibility as God's witnesses. The Holy Spirit is poured out there about guys when apostles in the first day after Jesus' resurrection. Then they cast lots and Lord felt the Messiah. So he was added to the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They, the apostles, were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a mighty violent wind came from heaven and they filled the whole house where they, the apostles, were sitting. No one except the apostles were promised the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you look carefully at the text, we'll see the pronoun they in chapter 2 and refers to the noun apostles in the last sentence of the first chapter. It was the apostles who were all together in one place when the Holy Spirit came upon them. It was a promise specific, specifically to the apostles, the apostles whom Jesus had chosen to be his witnesses to go out from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, the end of the world. Many people teach the 120 received the output of the Holy Spirit in their Pentecost. They missed the point. They missed the point of why God chose someone to replace Judas to become one of the twelve. According to Jesus, the apostles were guided into all truth. The apostles were to be witnesses and have brought to the remembrance all that Jesus had taught and did. There were only two out of the 120 that qualified. Matthias, two out of the two, remember the qualification for a witness. When the Holy Spirit came with power on Pentecost, how could the Holy Spirit give a gift of remembrance, total recall of all that Jesus did and taught, if the outpower pouring and the power were given to the 120, when many of them didn't have the qualification to be the witnesses that the Holy Spirit empowered? Only the twelve. In Acts 2, uh, into 2, 1 to 4, they cast a lot, a lot from Messiah. He was numbered with the eleven apostles. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as the rushing wind. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The eleven apostles filled with the Holy Spirit. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Acts 1 verse 10, And when they were staring as he went into heaven, behold, two men stood by them and white apparel and said, Men, Galileans, the twelve, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus whom you received, who was received up from you into heaven, will come back in this manner that you saw him go. Then they were all amazed, marvelling. Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? So they are all amazed, perplexed. Whatever could this mean? Others mocked, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said, Men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Heed my words. Okay? They were Galileans. They were the twelve. With the eleven apostles, when the day of Pentecost comes, suddenly they come a sign from heaven, they appeared in five tongues, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Look unto all these Galileans. Isn't it easy? It's, all, it's, easy. it's all in the book, you know. A sound like a sound of mighty wind. Not a wind, but a sound like a mighty wind. With the coming of the Holy Spirit came a sound like a blowing of a mighty wind. Not actually wind that made the sound, it was what they could call today as a sound effect. It got the attention of the crowds. They ran to the location where the sound seemed to be coming from. There they saw the twelve apostles who had been sitting and were now standing. The sight like fire, not fire, but like fire. They ran to the place where they were sitting. God had used a similar sign to get Moses' attention at Horeb, almost 2,000 years before. When this happened, they, the apostles, were filled with the miraculous power. They began to speak in other languages, so they got gifts as well as 
the uh, being in baptism of the Holy Spirit. The manifestation of the Spirit uh, was audible. It sounded like a violent wind. It was visible. It looked like fire descending, dividing, designating. It was internal. Inspiration and courage came. It was external, speaking languages they had not heard. Even on the God Channel, you, when t people talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, none of these things are, are seen or are available. This fulfilled what Jesus had promised. I'll ask the Father, he will give you another counselor who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit leads in, into all truth. The world at large can't receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you do, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. It's another, again, an element that comes through time after time after time. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. If you look at the God Channel, if you look in the internet, you've got all these different uh, groups, all these charismatic groups, all claiming to be led by the Spirit, all saying different things. How, how, how is the Holy Spirit able to do that? Or, or, or sh, you know, could, should, we, should we blame the Holy Spirit for doing that? Uh, certainly not. It's their fault, not the Holy Spirit's. They're claiming something they never received. This fulfilled what Jesus promised. The apostles would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In 1 verse 8, the baptism would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they would be Christ's witnesses. So there's power to come with this baptism. The apostles are described as men of Galilee. Uh, Peter stood up and preached with the eleven, shouted the crowd. Uh, some of you are saying these men are drunk. It's not true. It's much too early for that. Don't get drunk by nine o'clock in the morning. This fulfilled what Jesus promised in Acts 2.32. He was speaking of Jesus. And we, the apostles, are all witnesses that Jesus rose from the dead. In 237, those who heard asked Peter and the other apostles, what must we do about their sinful condition? Those who had responded to the preaching, the first converts, continued in the apostles' teaching. It's apostles all the way through. Uh, when you think about it, if the 120 had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then it should have been the they continued in their teaching in general, but it's the apostles that are seen to be doing the teaching and convincing. Those who responded to the preaching, the first converts, continued in the apostles' teaching. Those who believed Peter were baptized, 3,000 and all, and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. A deep sense of awe was upon them all, and the apostles did many miracles. This fulfilled what Jesus promised, Acts 2.43. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through everybody. There's 3,000 become Christians by now. No, all the wonders and signs are done through the apostles. <clears throat> In Acts 3, 6, Peter, an apostle, we don't have money for you, but I'll give you something else. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, and that's his walk. Peter took a lame man by the hand and pulled him to his feet. And as he did, the man's feet and ankle bones were healed and strengthened. So he came up with a leap, stood there a moment and began walking, and walking, leaping and praising God. He went into the temple with him. The lame man was healed miraculously by the Apostle Peter. This is again not stuff you see in the God Channel. In Acts 3.12, as though by his own power, or when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, men of Israel, why marvel at this man? Why have fastened your eyes upon us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made him to walk? Peter an apostle doing a miracle. Acts 4 verse 8 and 9 where Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Honorable leaders and the elders of our nation, have you mean the good deed done to the cripple and how he was healed? 4.33 says, The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus with great power. In Acts 5, this is, thousands have become Christians. If everybody had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and everybody was walking around speaking in tongues, if everybody was doing miracles, then why here four chap uh, three chapters later uh, from Acts chapter 2 to be signed in Acts chapter 5, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in the apostles uh, in, the, uh, in the porch. In <clears throat> Acts chapter 5 to 6, there is a change takes place. Philip was able to do miracles. Philip wasn't one of the apostles. Philip was one referred to in back in Acts chapter 5. The, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed unto them the Christ. 
and multitudes gave heed with one accord unto the things that were spoken by Philip, when they heard and saw the signs which he did. Philip was able to confirm the message he preached with some miraculous signs. How did he get the ability to do miracles? Sorry, it was Acts chapter. The apostles had laid hands in the mirror, Acts chapter 6, verse 5 and, for, and 6. This idea pleased the whole group. They chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith and in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas of Antioch, a Gentile convert of the Jewish faith, who had now become a Christian. These seven were presented to the apostles, who prayed for them and laid their hands upon them. Still on the Apostles, Acts 5.32, we are witness of these things, and so the Holy Spirit was given to those to obey him. The Apostle witnesses, the Holy Spirit was witnesses by confirming the Apostles' teaching by signs and miracles. Those who obey him refers back to Acts 5.29. Peter and the Apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human authority. The Apostles were obedient by preaching God's message as they had been chosen and commanded and the Holy Spirit confirmed the Apostles' message. In Acts 8.13, Simon himself also believed and being immersed prospectively with Philip, viewed signs and great miracles that was happening, he was astonished. Now when the Apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they came down, prayed concerning them, so they may receive the Holy Spirit. For as of yet it was fallen upon none of them, but they were only immersed in the name of Jesus Christ, when they laid hands upon them and they received the Holy Spirit. But when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered him money, saying, Give me this authority, in order that I may lay hands on whoever, and he may receive the Holy Spirit. Now at first reading, what, what's he talking about, receive the Holy Spirit? Is he talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Or is he talking about a gift by the Holy Spirit? He's certainly not talking about a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, have a look at that in the next lesson. Feel free to come back and continue with us. Every blessing.